things, exciting things are happening at the global box office like it's pre-COVID 2019. Driven largely by Hollywood's Barbenheimer craze and major local releases, current movie theaters for the first in a very, very long while are crowded. For a closer look at the race at the local box office, we're now joined by culture critic Isaac Kim. Good morning, Isaac. Morning, Lena. I have never been so excited to be back at the theaters and Oppenheimer lives up, uh, perhaps exceeds my expectations. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, most people have been saying that, you know, the ratings have been, the critics have been raving about it, Mm. uh, the scores online. And um, I think maybe uh, the only thing that I think in Korea we might have missed is the whole, you know, double feature, Uh. Oppenheimer. I mean, we got to kind of observe it um, from the outside. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I... the success of Oppenheimer is uh, very telling um, mm. of showing Christopher Nolan's popularity, you know, in Korea. He's he is also a very world famous director, uh, mm. very skilled, very um, critically acclaimed. Mm. But I think uniquely in Korea, his films have been um, they've resonated with audiences here, and uh, you know, like he he just has a, such a, a huge fan base in Korea. So I, I think so. <laughs> You didn't disappoint again, you know. Um, just for our listeners tuning in from abroad, we really didn't get to ride the Barbenheimer craze in South Korea specifically. Barbie was released a few weeks back, as we discussed on the program. Uh, the biopic Oppenheimer hit local theaters this week on Liberation Day, and I think it was scheduled that way to line up with Liberation Day. But its debut, belatedly oh, yeah. here, uh, was a massive success. So as you alluded to, Isaac, I mean, compared to Christopher Nolan's past films, how well did Oppenheimer do? Is it really a debut with a bang? Oh, yeah. I mean, the people were even comparing it to not even uh, Nolan's uh, previous films because, uh, you know, Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar was the most recent huge hit in Korea. And so people are comparing Oppenheimer's opening to Avatar's opening. And it's like right almost, you know, it's like, oh, it caught up. It was like number two, you know, right? Only second to Avatar. So not only was his um, base uh, and his fan, his fan base really coming out in support, but also the strategy of uh, releasing on Liberation Day. Mm. Um, I don't know if you saw. I don't know if you saw in the news, but the um, you know the the, the 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 fans or the audiences in Japan weren't so happy about Oppenheimer right. because right. the theme is you know you know it's very it's it's kind of a shameful moment um, for some you know in Japan with the loss of World War Two, but in Korea, like you know that's that's basically Liberation Day, right? Is where mm. we kind of Koreans got that um, the taste of freedom and. The end of Japanese rule, uh, and so it kind of signified a lot of things culturally. Mm. And this is the story of the guy who built the bomb, who uh, which kind of led to the liberation of Korea in some sense. You know, it's interesting because global box office scores are perhaps more important today than ever before. It's a much more globalized world. We like to watch different kinds of movies. It seems that we're more interested in foreign films too, not just Hollywood blockbusters, but depending on what timeline uh, each country is in and what their culture is like, what their history is, some movies perform well for one or two or three different reasons, and some movies don't. I mean, because if you look at Barbie's, let's be honest, relative flop in South Korea, it makes us raise questions like, are we just on a different timeline? Or maybe also, is a humor in Barbie way too American? I'm half American, so I enjoyed it. But I took a Korean Korean uh, husband and (laughs) he didn't seem too excited. (laughs) Did did he even know what Barbie was? I mean, did he play with Barbies or Ken when he was young? No. And as we discussed, even the leading actress, Margot Robbie, who is Australian, did not play with Barbies when she was growing up. Uh, So maybe you don't always have to have the same cultural context, but for one or two different reasons. Sometimes movies can flop at different local box offices and downright get banned for a different set of reasons, too. But first, do we even talk about how how well Oppenheimer is doing in South Korea? Oh, I mean, yeah, it's 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 doing really well. Um, I mean, I I saw that people were talking about like why is it so popular? You know, that was like the big biggest question. Okay. Um, and and part of that is probably because you know, like I said, there's the, the two factors of Nolan, uh, his popularity as an artist, as a director in Korea, as well as the marketing strategy of releasing it on Liberation Day, mm. uh, which has historic implications, mm. um, cultural, uh, the cultural nuance of like how this plays into you know the history of World War II and and Korea's. Uh, separation from Japan. So the independence um, spirit, I think, was also uh, deeply ingrained um, to the audience more than the filmmaker, Mm -hmm. because, you know, um, Nolan has also said that, you know, uh, when it comes to the controversy with Japan, you know, Mm -hmm. like he it's really focused on the man Oppenheimer and not really um, the aftermath of 
uh, like the man's work, uh, including Japan, as well as including in America the the native uh, the Native American population of the city that where Oppenheimer went to build the bomb. You in know, New so, Mexico, right? Right. So like there there's a lot of stuff that he was like trying to say like oh I, we're we're kind of not um, focusing on because we're just kind of telling this this one story of um, of, of kind of the, the the man behind the bomb, but. Robert yeah, Oppenheimer. That, 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 uh, I, I did see that some critics point out that if there is any criticism, is that if you're expecting sort of a war movie, things blowing up in your face, that's not it. It's a biopic. Look at the title. It is about Oppenheimer and the trials and tribulations of a genius, but a tortured genius at that. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people were saying that they were so disappointed by the um, explosions or or the lack <laughs> you know, like, thereof. <laughs> yeah, because you know, it's about it's about a nuclear bomb, but like. I believe, you know, like people are saying like, oh, my, this it wasn't as as, you know, uh, explosive as like <laughs> literally the, the, the most recent Marvel movie or something. And, mm-hmm. you know, partly it's because uh, before the movie came out, Nolan was very specifically um, addressing uh, like his vision for it, which was he, he didn't want to use the effects for the bomb. Um, he kind of wanted to be as physical or use physical effects as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like that was kind of a point that. You know, trying to make it look real. I think maybe audiences have have seen so much CGI now that like maybe uh, real is it's it's hard. Like real isn't good enough. But um, <laughs> but yeah, there is an art. There was an artistic choice that um, he you know he he said he made. So mm-hmm. that's that was an interesting um, kind of a reflection point for for about a criticism about this film. And and let's be honest. I mean, Christopher Nolan took the hard route uh, when you yeah. can rely on CGI at a fraction of the cost. I'd imagine. Uh, <laughs> Why choose to really blow things up and risk the safety and the budget and the concerns of people being overstimulated by CGI that when they see the real deal, well, not a real nuclear bomb, but at least something blowing up, it's it might be underwhelming. But I might add, I mean, the, the beauty and the elegance of this film is not just the, the story of Oppenheimer, but how kind of Christopher Nolan takes you on a journey with him, the intensity of leading up to that uh, big detonation. I mean, there's so much music and silence utilized, and I'm giving away way too much, but maybe we've been <laughs> overstimulated by nonstop streaming. But I, so I think it took me a while to readjust as well. But, you know, if Christopher Nolan films was some of your favorites, this might be right up your alley. Yeah. Also, um, you know, like his original intent for this film was to be seen like on the huge screen, right? Right. In like IMAX, right. in like 70 millimeter. Um, so, you know, like when you see that screen on a normal movie screen, maybe like it's not as impressive, perhaps, because we might not be watching it in um, the, the format that was originally envisioned by the director. So mm-hmm. that's another thing when you see, you know, some of the some of the uh, great movies we love to watch um, when we watch them on our phones at home. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's comforting and it's, it's really easy to watch. It's always there. But you might not get the full experience of being like immersed in like that surround sound with like the visuals at like, you know, uh, at scale. So there, that might be a factor because um, I, I do believe that they had problems, you know, oh, you know, remember we talked about how Tom Cruise and other filmmakers are, uh, were fighting over the premium screens. So, you know, this film was supposed to be seen on a premium screen, but I bet like 90%, this is a random number, but most people probably would not be able to see uh, Oppenheimer as it was intended. Yeah. Um, limited theater space, limited locations where you can have the full IMAX experience. Yeah. But there you have it. Uh, as for the IMAX option in Korea, it seems for this week, it was booked so fast, so solid. And I watch yeah. it in a smaller screen. But I might add, because I love biopics, I, I didn't mind at all having a slightly smaller screen. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you know, like without, if you don't anticipate the nuclear explosion, then, you know, like, yeah, watching on a small screen is, is uh, because it's, it's so story driven. It's so character yeah. driven, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and I yeah. mean, so much praise around every single actor in the film. I've perhaps, we've probably given away too much at this point, but I just wanted to ensure that, you know, people know exactly what they're going into because I signed up my husband for Barbie, not knowing what he was getting into. <laughs> and and the consequences of, of it was not really pretty. Uh, in second place at the local box office, I just want to mention before we move on, Concrete Utopia, that's a Korean film starring Lee byung and a host of other, uh, well, star-studded action. So be sure to check that out if that's your thing. The dual release of Barbie and Oppen 
Oppenheimer, it, it's it set off this need for us to return to theaters. It got people excited about the movie theater experience after all these years of being couch potatoes. Uh, it's kind of a beautiful synergy and a healthy competition because technically they're not really at their competition with each other. The genre is it couldn't be further away from each other. One is pink, one is black. Uh, <laughs> it seems like if you look at just sheer numbers, Barbie is winning, having crossed the one billion dollar mark worldwide. Is that not a staggering figure? But here's the thing that depending on which country you live in, Barbie could be even irrelevant or divisive. And so these really important questions of is wokeness and political posturing a double edged sword comes into play. Oh, yeah. I mean, I believe there was like 28 movies that uh, ever broke a tw- uh, billion dollars. Mm. And this is the 29th one. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, political posturing is, is it can be very dangerous when your when your motivation is to make a profit. You know, like you want to make sure <laughs> if you're selling something. Don't uh, offend you anyone. Sure that, right. You don't want to offend anyone. You want to sell it to the most number of people. Right. You want to make sure you don't uh, make your customers angry. Right. So. But um, yeah, especially in the U.S., uh, they're definitely, you know, the the political climate um, last, you know, a few years has has become so polarizing. So. I mean, I remember um, th- there was a very famous uh, conservative who uh, ranted over 30 minutes about how bad Barbie was, you know, and like this is before the movie even came out. And like or as soon as the embargo lifted, like he, he had he had it ready to go. And it was like, you know, that there's a phrase like people you'll um, sometimes use like go woke, go broke. Um, and then but the problem is, you know, uh a billion dollar movie by a billion dollar Barbie is like, it kind of def- defeats or you know, deflates that phrase. Mm. And also there's articles about how, uh, you know, Barbie, uh, because it is a kind of, there's a female, the, the lead is female, mm. the director's female. Mm. And so people were saying like, you know, it's drowning in fem- uh, feminism, right? Like <laughs> uh, criticism of Barbie saying that it's too feminist or like sure. stop lecturing us. And like, um, sure. so there was a lot of this uproar on, on, on one side of, um, on the spectrum but recently there was an article on fox news which is you know uh, the biggest u.s uh, conservative um news that organization was. like they were changing their narrative saying that it was actually maybe oh barbie was never woke it was actually barbie is actually an anti-woke you know movie and like that's a going different into, angle um, okay yeah i mean the, the the spinning of like how to justify uh that it, the billion dollar barbie movie um you know, basically destroy the go woke, go broke phrase is like, Mm. is what's going on. I think a lot of people are just trying to, you know, um, ride the coattails of Barbie's success, Mm. whether it's um, to, you know, gloat or whether it's to kind of like say face and like Mm. say, okay, maybe this movie isn't woke. And like, you know, half the people in in America probably don't even know what woke means. And so like, it it just, the political posturing um, definitely is the double edged sword. And, you know, most of the time, I'm sure, cast members, you know, directors and the mm-hmm. artists that are doing it would, would like to avoid them if possible. If possible. But when it was, a, let's be honest, a feminist charged movie, we knew it was going to be this way because Barbie, the doll itself and the brand that represents Mattel, I mean, they've been facing criticism for years, maybe even decades about the relevance of Barbie and how it sort of stipulates unrealistic expectations of the female body and inclusivity became a big question. And they knew that they had to readjust that narrative to stay relevant in a North American market. Now, the problem is each country where Barbie wants to sell millions and millions of tickets has different timelines. And when it comes to the fight for feminism or just equality in general, we're on different timelines. And so in Korea, for a number of different reasons, it seems to have fall a little short of expectations. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can't, you, you know, that's, that's another thing is you can't really please everyone, you know, you know, <laughs> a, as a business, you want to, uh, but that's the hard part, you know, that's the impossible paradox is mm. that you can't please everyone, you know, somebody like, for example, with Oppenheimer, you know, the, um, the so many people were critic, uh, the critics were raving about it, but, you know, the community in New Mexico was actually very offended, mm. the community in Japan, you know, war, it was a uh, uh, Warner Japan, um, in a rare moment, mm. uh, criticized their uh, parent company, mm. Warner uh, Brothers. You know, like so, there was even memes in Japan mm. of like comparing, you know, Barbenheimer to like um, 9/11 and trying to add, you know, that kind of context. Mm. So, yeah, definitely, you can't please everyone. Mm. 
Uh, it's tough when uh, movies cost so much to make and they would uh, profit and benefit from pleasing everyone. But you must take a stance. And it seems both Barbie and Oppenheimer have pretty strong voices. Now, for bona fide cinephiles, something really weird is happening at movie theaters. Uh, there was an entire Wall Street Journal article, and I thought that was fascinating. The cardinal rule has always been never take out a phone during the film. <laughs> it apparently no longer applies. Etiquette at public events have evidently become harder to control after the pandemic. We're we're talking about concerts and even movie theaters, too. So what's happening here? And is it a problem or could this be also a double edged sword? Maybe we can have special screenings where people can use phones so that people still end up coming to movie theaters. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's been, I think it's becoming a problem. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of audiences, uh, they were we were kind of conditioned over the decades of um, in what is considered movie theater etiquette but you know the pandemic kind of reset everything and you know all the rules kind of got sent out you know thrown out the window so i mean like i remember um when you go to a movie theater some most most people probably um are, are used to thinking of movies if you've gone to movie theaters before it's a dark dark place and you want to you know send your, you want to put your phone in do not disturb mode or, or t turn down the brightness you know but um, recently that Wall Street article was talking about how so many people were in the theater and just like blatantly taking photos and videos for their social media. So mm. I think that is this kind of level of um, disturbance, guess, uh, breaking, yeah. yeah, breaking the cardinal rule. I think it, this is new. That's why the, the article came out, because I don't, don't think the audiences have been so, um, you know, blatant in about like mm. kind of not caring about the rest of the movie experience. If you've ever taken out your phone in a movie theater, which I have done too, you know, when the movie is playing, say like, and this is before I, maybe, you know, you, you forgot to turn your phone off or you mm. forgot to, you know, turn, do not disturb off. And then you, you pick up your phone. It's so bright mm. that it like blows your own eyes out. You know, like it used to be like, oh, we gotta be, gotta be quiet. You gotta kind of, you know, uh, make sure you don't have, you know, like you don't want to trigger anybody else around you. Cause everyone, most everyone, when you go to the movie is there for that experience. Mm. I think these days, um, you know, like you said, coming out of the pandemic, I think a lot of people, um, you know, they're they have they're going to the movies with different kind of expectations. Mm -hmm. Some people not maybe they, they haven't they forgot what it's like to see a movie with <laughs> other people. You know? So um, I think that this is going to be something that the movie theaters will have to adapt mm -hmm. um, because uh, there is a point about how being at home when you when you watch a movie on uh, at home and you can in the comfort of your home, you can like pause it. You can take photos of it. You can, you can post talk while you're to watching. your friends and your family members. Yeah. So there's a lot of that kind of culture of watching content that has kind of changed. I don't think you could put that genie back in the bottle. But at the <laughs> same time, you know, at the movie theater, uh, it's a different experience that people are going to have to kind of re-educate themselves or readjust to. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be it's going to be tough for a while because there's going to be people who are like, why not? Why can't you? And it's yeah. like, well, well, as, I guess. <laughs> like, uh, because uh, that was the status quo and that probably won't be sufficient. And movie theaters want the theater goers to continuously come out and have incentive to go out again, claw your way out of your own home and your couch and go back yeah. into theaters. So this talk of war will likely continue. I just thought it was fascinating because I've lived one set of film etiquettes in my mind for <laughs> 35 years and suddenly we're yeah. undoing it and it's, it was very confusing uh, Isaac like always we've run out of time <laughs> oh okay have a good one we appreciate it we'll speak to you soon if you're listening to our program using the podcast service just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday 7am Korea Standard Time so tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input see you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul